I really enjoy travelling by train, but in Norfolk the number of destinations we can reach is quite limited. Norfolk is a big county and it was once crisscrossed by railway lines, so it's quite surprising there are so few left today. In this programme, I'll be finding out what happened to Norfolk's railways almost half a century ago. I'll be meeting critics of the closures who say that by losing the railways, we've been left with a more polluted environment. Back in the 60s, the, the transport policy wrecked the railway system in many ways. And along the way, I'll be visiting the diehards who are determined to turn the clock back by hatching an ambitious plan to create a new orbital railway for Norfolk. And I believe the people who live out here in rural England, they want to see the railways back. Railways have got a future. We really mustn't throw this away as we did in the 60s. This is the Norwich to Sheringham line, the only national network service to the North Norfolk coast. It was earmarked for closure in the 1960s, when Britain's railways were losing so much money that a drastic overhaul was needed. Head of British Railways at the time was Dr Richard Beeching, and his name is synonymous with the cuts he recommended. However, this line won a reprieve, and steadily, over the past three decades, it has turned its fortunes round, proving that rural branch lines can pay their way. Now called the Bitten Line, it has been voted one of the 50 best railway journeys in the world. But we haven't always been so caring about railways. Over a 10-year period, from the mid-1950s, the dismantling of Norfolk's railways began. But it wasn't until Dr Beeching published his now infamous report in 1963 that the magnitude of what was happening sunk in. To be fair to Dr Beeching, his 1963 report recommended that just four Norfolk lines get the chop. The drip, drip, drip of closures had started before him, so his legendary axe only wielded the final death blow. What is less well known is that the doctor prescribed a second report, and the prognosis for that had even worse news for Norfolk. This is what the rail map of Norfolk would have looked like had Beeching got his way. Trains to Norwich, and nothing more. It was too much for the government to contemplate, and too much for the public to stomach. So in the number of lost rail lines, Norfolk got off lightly in comparison with other areas. But there was another loss. Norfolk was isolated, its tourism and economy suffered. And it's that damage which has not healed even today. Much of the Norfolk landscape has changed little since medieval times, when it was one of the most important counties in the country. But after the Industrial Revolution, it went into decline, only being revived again with the coming of the railways during the Victorian boom years of railway mania. They opened up the region to tourism from the Midlands. Norfolk's economy boomed again for the first time since the Middle Ages. The steam trains transported thousands of visitors to the coastal resort year after year. The pioneers pushed tracks across the county, competing to reach the best destinations. Even a rural backwater like Melton Constable found itself at the centre of the railway boom. But that was before beaching, and now all that's left are the memories kept alive by railway historian Ray Meek. So there are sort of two tentacles, one from the west, one from the south, and they meet or they collide in Norfolk. But they were setting themselves up for a big fall, weren't they? Because yes, this is yes. not a sensible economic infrastructure. Even if they found the line didn't pay, what they should have done, my idea, would have been to uh, close it but leave everything in place. Leave the lines and ballast on, right. on the track beds so that it could be mothballed. And if, if fortunes changed uh, at a later date, we'll bring back the railways. Ernest Marples, being the transport minister at that particular time, he um, had a transport business and um, I think really in the back of his mind 
he thought uh, the more railways I can close up, the more I'm going to benefit by the transport going on the road. That's a rather controversial view, right? You're saying that there are forces at work to nobble the railways um, for their I, own interests? Yes, yes, that's how I look at it anyhow, and I think a number of other people do. Rival train companies transformed the hamlet of Melton Constable into a busy railway town. Three different lines converged here. There were workshops and marshalling yards. So it was particularly devastating when the closures came. Another of Ray's maps shows just how industrious the town was. What a beautiful map. Isn't it peculiar with this? Why is it curved like this? Well, uh, it follows the railway uh, don't exactly. Believe it. They've um, made a map to follow the line of the railway in this big curve. Yes. How amazing. Yes. This map, for the first time, has revealed to me the real human cost, human price to be paid for rationalising an economy. Yes. yes. And it's one thing to decide what's efficient down in Whitehall, but probably made without any realisation that there's going to be a real human price to be paid in places like Melton Constable. It became a dead town. I think the whole village was completely numb from the, the speed with which people were just dismissed, full stop. Yeah. Got no real jobs to go to. Not on the Monday morning. Uh, all they could offer us was uh, work in a gang to pull the roads to pieces, signal boxes out and everything, you know, telegraph poles a lot, everything. Mm. My thoughts about Mr Beechin are all bad ones, because uh, if I had laid hands on him, I think I'd have broke his neck. After the final round of Beeching's closures, the railway community of Melton Constable just shut down. Although alternative jobs were offered, it meant relocating to other parts of the country, a proposal not widely welcomed. Most of the out-of-work men and women left the railway business for good. So railways were consigned to the scrap heap. An invention barely over a century old was deemed to be a national financial catastrophe. In some parts of the country, an extensive road building program started. But for Norfolk, however, there was a double whammy. It lost its railways and it didn't get any new roads either. And without a proper transport network, the county was going nowhere again. To this day, Norfolk remains one of the few counties in Britain without an inch of motorway. Its rich heritage and unique landscape would struggle to attract visitors and revenue once more. Yet the natural charms that make Norfolk so special have returned in abundance with so many disused railway lines reverting to wild places. Part of the appeal of these wild places is coming across relics from the railway age, like this plate layers hut built in 1914 and left just as it was. This black tar on the walls is a byproduct from the gasworks at Melton Constable. A team of six men would huddle in here for warmth before venturing out to maintain the permanent way, as it was called. What is it that makes these relics so evocative? What is it that so stirs our psyches with a yearning for railways? And what is it that makes grown men weak at the knees at the sight of a hut like this? In Norfolk, the urge among those same grown men to play with full-sized train sets is so strong that they've become obsessed with reversing the decisions of beaching. At Whitwell and Reefham Station, I come across the first sign that beaching's work could be undone. It was very sad, you know, the, with the Beechings Act and the, the cutting of all the small lines was, was a shame because nowadays, especially where we are here now, it would be the ideal thing to get into Norwich. To go from here to Norwich in 1958 used to take 21 minutes. 
it'd take 40 minutes by car now, and if that railway was still there, all that time saved. This is the old fashioned way. As well as restoring a station from the past, Mike has an eye for the future. He believes he can eventually build a railway fit to take passengers. I think it is already being taken seriously. It looks a bit mishmash at the moment, but there's no rolling stock going to run over it until it's perfectly level, perfectly straight and everything. We built this first line here, which is 360 feet long. Um, yes, it took us several months doing, but it's great. You know, just driving the train up and down those 360 feet of track is absolutely fantastic, seeing as nothing has run in this goods yard here for what, nearly 50 years now. While there may not be an immediate use for track beyond Mike Uri's backyard, there is a more established service just down the line. The Mid-Norfolk Railway, preserved when the line from Wyndham to Deerham was rescued, is attracting tourists, but needs commuters to survive. Its main source of income up till now has been from the heritage market, the tourist market, if you like. But we're not in a tourist area. And most of us also would like to see it develop as a complete railway, if you like. We own the track all the way to Wyndham Junction. We are joined up to Network Rail, and we're very lucky as a private railway to have that connection still there. I can recognise the psychological boost these serious-minded railway enthusiasts feel when they know they're joined to the National Network. Could these railways be rebranded? as services for paying commuters travelling cheek by jowl with holidaymakers. Another man who certainly thinks so is David Bill. His family was so affected by the closures during the beaching era that he vowed to repair the damage. My family arrived here in about 1883. My great-grandfather was the first station master. They were, they were railway people through and through. I was brought up on this stretch of line at that time, you could travel everywhere across Norfolk, across England. After the closure was brought about, the demolition people moved in, and what they couldn't take away as scrap, they blew up on the spot. It was a criminal act. It was an act taken against the interests of the people of this country, and to this day, I've always felt bitter. David joined a preservation group who rescued this line from Beeching's Axe and turned it into the North Norfolk Railway, one of the county's best-loved attractions. No longer involved in the day-to-day -day running of this preserved line, David has moved on to bigger things. His dream is to see a unified railway using both heritage and commuter services. David, this is a museum piece. This is not a modern train. How are you going to mix the two up? There's no reason why modern trains couldn't travel on this just as heritage trains do. The key to it is, of course, look at this train here. Look, it is absolutely 100% packed with people. And here we are in the, in, in the middle of autumn, pouring rain. And yet, so how much more could, they, could these trains carry if they were carrying shoppers, if they were carrying people going to work? How are you going to do that? We're going to build a railway. We've formed a new company. We've called it the Norfolk Orbital Railway, and we're going to try and build on the success of the Bitten Line, which, is, which improves every year, on the Mid-Norfolk Railway from Wyndham to Dereham, which improves every year, and on this North Norfolk Railway. And we believe if the will is there, then the, the whole of this part of, the, of North Norfolk and Central Norfolk could be regenerated to a degree that is unimaginable at the moment. And how much cash are you talking about to rebuild this railway? We've estimated that the thing can be built for £30 million. Looking at the map of the proposed route, it's easy to share David's optimism to complete the circle when so much of the track bed still exists. But is it as simple as David makes out to rebuild the bridges and dig up the ploughed fields in a landscape that's not seen a train for nearly 50 years? David, this is a, a magnificent bridge, but just look at the ivy and the crumbling brick. Surely you're talking about an enormous leap of faith to imagine trains thundering over our heads once again. Well, they did, and it wouldn't take that much to put the rails back across the top. We've seen earlier today how trains put back onto heritage lines are filled with passengers. There's no reason why this shouldn't be filled with passengers again. Are you not a bit of a sentimentalist? I mean, well, I, we've, we've, we've done the feasibility studies. The people have said they want to use the trains again, so let's put it back for them to use. 
David, the land above our heads right now is in private ownership. It seems to me that your £30 million budget is perhaps a huge underestimate. You're going to need an army of lawyers, civil engineers, you're going to need the help of politicians, enormous numbers of people to help you make this, this dream happen. When we started off 40 years ago, we didn't have any of these people on our side at all, and yet we created that, that North Norfolk Railway. We did it by volunteer effort, and so much in this country is done by volunteer effort. Relying on people to devote spare time to supporting heritage lines is one thing, but when it comes to constructing a commercial paying passenger service with volunteer labour, that's surely different. It's like asking willing helpers to build a motorway. To see for myself how difficult it is to build a railway, I joined a working party at Deerham Station on the Mid-Norfolk Railway. Oh, railway lines are heavy, aren't they? It certainly is. This particular panel here weighs about four tonnes. <laughs> four tonnes? Four tonnes. Glad I had a big breakfast. Right. I'm beginning to understand how much sweat and toil was involved when those Victorian navvies built their railways. If the Norfolk Orbital Railway is going to be built with volunteer labour, it's going to need a phenomenal amount of dedication. This is hard work. So how long does it take to lay a quarter of a mile of track like this home? With volunteer labour, it's around six to eight weeks just to assemble the components. So would you volunteer to help lay 30 or 40 miles of the Norfolk Orbital? In all honesty, I probably wouldn't, purely because um, our workload is such that uh, the maintenance activities that we undertake on the 10 miles that we've got already occupy around 75% of our time. So if you multiply that up, we need a lot more volunteers to just push we're in a position to support another railway. So they can't rely on volunteers to do it then. Owen Stratford is in his 20s with a first from Oxford in civil engineering. He builds railway lines for the London Underground. Therefore he's well placed to bring a sense of perspective to the orbital's plans. Yeah, 30 million I suspect slightly uh, underestimates uh, the cost of the project. I would say as a, as a sort of off-the-top-of-my-head figure, that would probably just about pay for the, the major civils works like the bridge replacements, um, reconstruction of cuttings and earthworks. Uh, so I'm assuming that they're relying entirely on other sources of income to actually lay the track itself and rebuild the stations and get the trains running. The Norfolk Orbital is a grand plan and depends on connecting old lines, some of which are used as bridleways and cycle paths, as well as working railways. John Hull needs extra cash to extend his mid-Norfolk line to Fakenham. How does he feel about shipping into the orbital? The aspirations of the mid-Norfolk railway obviously have to come first, um, because for a start, if we don't get through to Fakenham, the Norfolk orbital hasn't got much of a chance anyway. Um, but we work, we keep in touch with them, we communicate with them. I'm the liaison with the Norfolk orbital railway people. And um, we feel that working together is better than working separately. But in the long run, the MNRs aspirations obviously must come first. At Sheringham Station on the North Norfolk Railway, I meet the managing director Hugh Harkett to get his views on the orbital. His priority is to maintain a nostalgic atmosphere. Yet he does have expansion plans of his own. You can see behind me here, this is the Sheringham North Norfolk Railway Station, uh, which we have preserved under a heritage uh, agreement. And on the right-hand side here, you've got the Sheringham Network Rail Station. The link between the two has been severed since about 1968. And what we're trying to do now is to restore that link across the road here so that we can bring trains in a few times a year and also perhaps to kick-start the whole idea of the eventual uh, linking of the, of the railways through Norfolk. And the Norfolk Orbital Railway needs your section of track to work, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. How are you going to negotiate that dual use of this, of this, what has been a heritage railway line? One of the problems would be, in any case, is during the day, is fitting in our service with any commuter service. Well, what you have to remember is this railway was saved to run heritage trains. So, you know, there is a, 
if you like, a, a compromise to make here somewhere. And we're, we're not an uncompromising people, but we must have our, our way to operate our line after all. We have our signal boxes, which are also heritage, and we want to operate to that kind of method, you know? The speeds might be an issue. Uh, this line, after all, is limited to, to, to a lower speed than, shall we say, the network rail uh, network is, you know? And will you allow modern customers to use your heritage railway station? I would think it would be better if we kept the two separate. And that's what we're proposing now, in fact, is that something along the lines of keeping them as a separate entities. Rail segregation? Well, possibly. Yeah. It comes to Sheringham. <laughs> Sheringham West and Sheringham East. Two classes of customer. <laughs> Just connecting the heritage lines is a challenge. But if the Norfolk Orbital Railway is to succeed, the rail operator, National Express, needs to get on board. Would you acknowledge any commercial advantage to yourselves as a commercial operator to being connected onto a heritage line? I think it's difficult to make a, a snap evaluation, but certainly where we can see more interest generated in a route, then that will have a commercial spin-off for us as the operator. And how do you feel about being connected in the longer term to the Norfolk Orbital Railway? Well, again, I mean, I think those decisions are much further down the line and we need to concentrate on developing really the, the network that we have now and, and building still further the, the, the interest in this route. But certainly I think as public transport improves and more people use the trains and environmentally it's seen as the right choice, then that's a very interesting concept. As I expected, National Express are reluctant to give anything more than their tacit approval, given that the ultimate decision to back the orbital would have to come from the government. Government policy's got to change. They've got to be more proactive towards rail. Um, at the moment, it's still, the odds are stacked against rail reopenings and improvements. Uh, for instance, if, if a rail reopening is suggested, um, the government will look at how many cars or lorries will come off the road and will look at the amount of tax that they will lose from the petrol that won't be used, and they'll add that to the cost of the railway line. So, you know, things are difficult. To get some idea of government thinking on the future of Norfolk's railways, I meet Norwich South MP Charles Clark. How does he rate the chances of the orbital happening? There's no doubt in my mind that investing in rail is the right way to go. Is it financially viable? That's a big, big test. Uh, they've been going through that and they've been able to get support for some necessary changes, for example, up in Sheringham. Uh, but uh, the overall viability is a big question. Can it ever be environmentally friendly? Of course, there's room for improvement environmentally in the technology of, ra of, of trains, and that is happening and will happen. I'm as passionate for a cause as the railway enthusiasts, but mine is a different one, the environment. Ever since I started work on this programme, I've been wondering how we can possibly countenance a return to the countryside of diesel-guzzling, fossil-fuel-consuming iron giants. To find out just how green railways can be, I visit the Environmental Science Centre at the University of East Anglia, where studies have been done analysing the carbon footprint of trains. The figures are bewildering, but the evidence is persuasive. One passenger travelling on a train over one kilometre emits less carbon than one person in a car over the same distance. So we would be talking about 100 grams per passenger kilometre by car, so the train is winning hands down. What about the carbon cost of constructing railway lines? A lot of the railway line, remember, has a track bed of gravel, and gravel is a natural material, so the cost in carbon is only just transporting it to the site and a little bit of earth moving. But in the case of a motorway, we have got a large and much wider concrete base, or tar more energy consuming. What do you feel about a full railway network returning to Norfolk? Since the trains are going to be much more efficient, we still could be travelling, but we would be using less resources. So it's not only a carbon emission issue, it's also thinking about an energy security issue for the long-term future. For railways to get a clean bill of health is all grist to the mill of the Orbital's promoters. To achieve a greener transport system would be sweet revenge for those who believe that Beeching's short-sightedness led to congested roads. Roads may have ousted the railways nearly 50 years ago, but by accident rather than design, the real winner was nature. 
Historically, Norfolk was regarded as the first green county since the Industrial Revolution passed it by. Many want to see it continue to build on that reputation, but reinstating railways could be a backward step. Pensthorpe Wildlife Park, near Fakenham, helps place Norfolk at the forefront of nature conservation. And why is it significant? Well, it's just a beautiful, beautiful part of the world, and, and um, a lot of people come to North Norfolk because of the wildlife and the unspoiled nature of it. Oh, it's incredibly peaceful and quiet here. How important is that? I think it's very important for the wildlife. You know, they know they don't want to be pushed about. And now I think that's exactly one, one of the reasons, you know, North Norfolk is pretty unpopulated, as you know. Um, and this is, you know, one of the probably, you know, least populated. We're right in the head, head of the Wensome River here. Um, it is very quiet. It's, it's got a lot of animals that you just don't get other places. That peace and quiet could be shattered. Pensthorpe has two disused railway lines running through it, which would be crucial to the development of the orbital. New routes bypassing the reserve are an option, but the estimated cost of £30 million would substantially rise. How would you feel about trains thundering along here? Once well, again. sadly, it would just be totally inappropriate. You know, 60 years it's been recolonised by wildlife. Um, it would just be like, you know, driving a sort of industrial corridor straight through a national park, you know. <laughs> it would be gross. The thing about this, the railway track bed is still here. And it's very, it'd be very easy just to, to relay it with sleepers in the line. Um, not against uh, railways, but, I mean, you shouldn't come play through places like this. It would be really crazy. The orbital's undoing might well be Norfolk's rich wildlife that benefited unintentionally from the byproducts of beaching. Just nine miles short of Pensthorpe, at County School Station, the tracks abruptly stop. The destiny of this preserved line and the entire gamble of the Norfolk orbital remains in jeopardy. Nevertheless, the undaunted optimists press on like the Victorian railway pioneers of the past. Well, this is the end of the line, and beyond this, we've got a huge amount of work to do to get any further. Uh, it would be impossible in some people's minds, but we really think we can do it. All over the country, rails were ripped up by beaching and others. By using what's left, by making use of the heritage railways, we can extend the railway network and we can get people out of their cars and onto the trains. Beeching redrafted the map of Norfolk, but the lines he rubbed out have remained as shadows on the landscape. Norfolk is one of Britain's most vital assets. Its fertile farmland is essential for future food security. Its endless beaches and the Norfolk Broads are perfect for tourism. It's a world leader in climate science and its high rates of sunshine and wind are ideal sources of renewable energy. What's missing is an efficient transport system. A rejuvenated low carbon rail network using Beeching's axed routes could well be the answer. And Beeching's Tracks is back in two weeks' time here on BBC4. And next Thursday, there's another chance to catch Time Shift's view on the last days of steam. That's here next week at nine. <laughs>